Sorry I haven't managed to get the recording from last week uh, up here for you, but uh, that, that's in progress. Right, several things to do today. The first one is, how many of you have seen the email from Wayne Rippon last week linking to the um, tutorial groups for tomorrow? Has everybody seen their name on those lists? Anybody who hasn't? If your name isn't on the list, then uh, come and see me at some stage, maybe straight after, well not really after this, but um, tomorrow morning, uh, or email me is even better, and then I can allocate you to one of the slots where there's space. So if you haven't found it already, just go to the, uh, to the module info that's here. In fact, let me just switch this off to so we see what you can see. And there's the module handbook, which I sort of took you through a little bit, talked to you a bit about last week. And here is the PDF that Wayne created with all of the um, <coughs> tutorials and the room and which group you're in. Now, the point about the eight or so hour block is that's when I'm available in the lab and you will come for the one hour session that's allocated to you. If you need, if you think there's a need for some reason to, to change, uh, then come and talk to me and we'll try and arrange a swap because we're quite close to the capacity of those, um, the lab for the tutorials tomorrow. <coughs> Are you beginning to get the hang of using course resources, folks? Nice and easy to navigate. How many of you are using your smart devices, your tablets and smartphones, and the University of Derby app to get into this, or the course resort, the Blackboard app to get into these resources? So let's go by, one by one. PCs and sort of proper web interfaces. <coughs> Everybody. Smart devices using the browser. Smart devices using the University of Derby app. Smart devices using the Blackboard app. Oh, a goodly range, excellent. Because that's gonna help you to learn how things work, how things may not necessarily work quite as well as we would like them to work. Um, and one of the biggest problems we have with all of our IT these days is that almost all of the apps on our smart devices, at least, are in a permanent state of beta development. There is no concept in the world of developing apps and a lot of main, mainstream software of here it is and it will stay stable for the next year while we build up a list of requirements from the users and then we'll release them as a major upgrade in a year's time. No, it's beta testing all the time. If we introduce bugs, well, we'll try and solve them in the next release, the ne next month or next couple of weeks, and, and, and. We're all familiar with our uh, app stores and the updates for our devices and these sort of devices and we get a torrent of updates don't we every month and we wonder do we really want to update them is it important does it change something uh, you know, when I upgraded from one of the older BBC versions on this which worked a treat the new newer version kind of messed it up and made it much more <laughs> difficult to see what was going on and navigating because it it used to be just a quick flicking, you've got a nice little ribbon that way with dinky tiny images. No, 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 that's not good enough. We've got to give you big images that take up half of your screen. Does it work? Varies. So as you go through the next few years of your career here, take the opportunity to look at what you are actually seeing in all of the systems that you use, all the IT products and carefully reflect upon them, are they really delivering value? Are they actually meeting my need in the way that I want it, or is something else happening? And then you think about, well, what would I do to make it better next time? Because <coughs> one of you guys are going to go out there, hopefully in your third year, for your placement year, and then after you've graduated, you'll be going out there to do things. And some of you are going to be supporting and developing apps and systems and so on and so forth. And so take this, these next three years 
while you're actually here on campus and your year while you are uh, in your placement, to start thinking reflectively about what's doing going well and why, because that way you understand what you need to do in the future, and what isn't going as well as supports my needs, why, so you understand what's causing those problems, and then think on to the next stage, and how can they be made better? That's really what our profession is all about, or should be. And yet, we see so many IT projects not delivering what's really required, both for the users outside, that's us for our smart apps and so on, and for in our internal customers, the admin team here in the University of Derby who are doing things like admissions, who are doing things like all of the uh, exam boards. How do those systems really support what they need to do to make it quicker, less error prone, <coughs> and just generally more effective? So that's really what our biggest challenge, and I want you all to be thinking about that as you develop into your chosen specialism within the whole of the computer science framework, whether it's the networking, security, IT, computer <coughs> science, CGP, CGMA, or forensic investigation, all of you <coughs> will be able to make things better in the future. If you take the opportunity now to think about, you've got plenty of time for thinking. That's why, you know, we're talking about 40 odd hours a week is the load you should be uh, imposing on yourself to do university type work. If you can do that on a nine to five basis, Monday to Friday, then go and enjoy yourselves on Saturday and Sunday. Or have a part time job or something. But spend that time, at least nine to five type of uh, hours, Monday to Friday, working on all of your work here and thinking and reading widely. Get as much information. You will never have this, this amount of time to actually spend reading, learning, <coughs> thinking, analyzing, critically evaluating and so on. Once you get out there in the big, big wide world, your job will be pressure, pressure, pressure the whole time. So think about those sort of things. while I think about that as well, rather than cause a huge blockage at the door on the way out, I'm going to pass this round. So please make sure you scan your own card during the lecture once and once only, because the software that reads these works on binary addition. If you have two zaps of your card, one plus one equals zero. Well, one zero, but if you've only got the least significant digit left over, one plus one equals zero. And that means, yes, it knows you've come to the lecture, but it will add it up and give you not present. So just once only, folks. All the way around from end to end, all the way to the top. And if you haven't got your card, tough. You will, be, will not be registered here today. Um, it takes too long for me to update your records if you send me an email. So it's in your, oi, quietly. It's in your interest to ensure you come with your card every day. You can't get into the library if you haven't got it and so on. So make sure you have your card every day you are here. today is about researching and writing. And the reason I want to do that today is because tomorrow you're going to start researching for your assignment. I'm going to take you through briefly the assignment today as well so that you understand what it is you're doing over the next five, six weeks in terms of researching and then developing an article. And tomorrow and the succeeding um, tutorials or workshops on the Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon, I will be working with you to refine the topic
and then individually working with you to refine the way that you're researching, coming up with really great ideas that are capable of getting those 60% and above uh, marks for your assignments. So that's the first part, is looking at the assignment. This is the standard format for assignment specifications that you will mostly be seeing. <coughs> tells you the handing deadline, uh, tells you when I set it, um, it tells you it might have a title or it might not. This one doesn't have a title, it just has assignment because the title is for you to essentially choose. And it looks at the second of the two learning outcomes. You are going to demonstrate the ability to find, evaluate, and interpret quantitative and qualitative data in order to develop uh, and present lines of argument in, a, in an appropriately academic format. So you're going to learn how to write a proper <coughs> academic uh, report, and there's lots of data and information that you are going to be researching. And we have our own computers for everyone magazine, e magazine, which is up on the uh, o open journal system. And we want you to research and then write an article to academic standards, which is basically to do with the impact of computers on everyday life, as you can read up there. And what we want you to do is to look at how things have changed over the last 20 or 30 years. That's just half of my life with computers. And we're going to be looking, you're going to be able to choose one of the four big topics there. The rise of social media and smart devices. <coughs> Artificial and machine intelligence and cognitive computing. The role of location services on smart devices in modern life. Or cyber fraud and crime. And the little bullet uh, underneath each of those kind of gives you a little bit of an inkling of the direction that you might want to take. So social media and smart devices is really a critique of how communications between people has changed over the last 20 or 30 years, from the time we did everything almost face-to-face -face or over landlines, to now we communicate hugely with these little things, and we're busy texting all the time, whether SMSs or whatever. And some research is showing that you know, some of your generation, the younger ones, use these not as a phone. A voice call? Dear me. That's so out of date. And so you're using all sorts of other apps, all text-based. And that's having huge impact on how people socialise, how people understand each other as people, other, or how people understand what is Communication. The next topic, artificial and machine intelligence and cognitive computing. That's looking back over history because the first AI systems were written or developed, beginning to be developed in the 1960s, 1970s. And in 1985 or thereabouts, around about the middle of the 1980s, American Express developed their own AI system that could actually work out that from the patterns of behavior, the sort of registration you had with your Amex card, it was a business card or was a pr Amex private and so on, it would be able to authorize a transaction without the vendor, the hotel or the whatever, phoning up Amex to see, am I allowed to do it? 
because they understood the patterns and the AI system could do that pattern recognition of where people were traveling to. And so when I was traveling with Rolls-Royce Aerospace in the mid 80s and had the company personal Amex card, as long as I went, once I started on the traveling in the mid 80s, it didn't matter. I went to a hotel, handed over, put it in, and it was authorized because it, the Amex AI system knew that I was traveling on business, and this was a business hotel, and it's in one of the places where Rolls-Royce people would typically live, so I'll stay, and no problem. No phone call, which took however long it would take. Now, that has changed. There's lots and lots of different AI systems, and machine learning, machine intelligence has developed, <coughs> and today, there are some amazing AI type of systems. How many of you got Apple phones, base phones? Quite a few. So some of you may be using Siri. How many of you have got uh, Microsoft-based phones? So you're using Cortana, perhaps. So Cortana and Siri are using AI constructs, AI type of concepts, to be able to understand natural language. <coughs> IBM have developed over the last few years a truly amazing system called Watson. Watson is a cognitive engine, it's kind of AI, but it's got lots of other things added around it. And <coughs> we're going to hopefully, for those of you doing BSCIT, over the next two, three years, you are going to come in contact with many of the IBM functions, including Watson Analytics. And so there's huge changes going on there, the power of these cloud-based systems that do some truly amazing things. And about two years ago, three years ago, uh, IBM went head to head with human beings in a, a TV game on, uh, that runs in America called Jeopardy. How many of you have heard of Jeopardy? Did any of you see the uh, competition between <coughs> Watson uh, on Jeopardy and the human being? It thrashed the human beings completely. Yeah, absolutely thrashed them. Quicker, faster, good justification. And it's, they've also trained one version of Watson to do oncology, cancer diagnosis and treatment advisement. And it ingested about three quarters of a million of the documents that have been published about um, understanding <coughs> cancer, diagnosing cancer, treating cancer, understanding the relationship between the symptoms that each patient was, being present, was presenting with and it's now better than the human being. Because it can ingest tens of thousands of new documents pretty much every week. No human being can keep up to date with medical advance at that rate. So there's an enormous range of things here that you can be looking at in, to draw upon in terms of your research on artificial machine intelligence and machine learning and cognitive computing. The next topic is location services as used in here, the uh, assisted GPS. How many of you with your various smart devices of all sorts, whether <laughs> Android, Microsoft, or iOS, how many of you have location services switched on in some way or another? How many of you let your phone tag the photos <laughs> with the location? How many allow Facebook, for example, to pick up your location? Okay. Have any of you got apps sort of like with, I don't know, Costa or Starbucks or other shops so that they can send you appropriate adverts or vouchers as you walk around or travel around town and so on? Okay. The point here is uh, that Location services are a major, very, very major uh, focus of attention of the retail industry and many, many other parts of in business. They want to know where we are at all, as much of, as possible all the time. And the research that some of my final year students did last year shows that location services are in great demand in all sorts of fields, including uh, forensic investigation and, crimi and criminal prosecutions and so on, and defense, at the smart device level and at the network level, the cell level. 
And the real question here is how accurate are these gadgets? And it turns out that they are, depending on what you need, what your purpose is, they are kind of perhaps vaguely okay. About 85% of the locations that we've captured, we've got about three, three and a half thousand data points at the moment, which is the biggest data set that anyone has collected in the world about the accuracy of these in a whole range of conditions. Something of the order of 85% are within 25 meters plus or minus of where they tr the, the person or the phone actually was. Which is not as good as <coughs> GPS is supposed to be. It's supposed to be able to tell you 95% um, of the time that you're where you are within plus or minus 10 meters. The rest of the 85 of the 15% can be from 25 meters out to well, I've got one at 1600 kilometers error, which is kind of not very helpful if you're trying to find places. I've got photos which I've taken in clear with a clear visibility the whole horizon just about, uh, which are <coughs> about sort of five, six, seven kilometers in error for the first one or two uh, photos. So there's an opportunity in that topic to, to research widely into location services, how they're used, who wants to use them, why they're being used in different industry sectors or in criminology to prove that you were or weren't where a crime was committed. And then the th fourth one is cybercrime, uh, cyber fraud, cybercrime. And we know that our systems are not terribly good in terms of security. We know that last year, something like a billion, that's a thousand million people had their credentials stolen from a whole range of systems around the world, whether gaming systems, uh, supermarket <coughs> organizations, etc., etc., etc. And so here's an opportunity to do some research into the nature of cyber fraud, cyber crime, um, ID, theft, and so on. And then to look at the question of how we now detect or prevent cybercrime. And you know, again, in all of these topics, look back 20 odd years, was it a problem? How did it happen? <coughs> how did these things work? As a sort of background to the context and then lead forward into what's happening today. Now, these are big topics. You can't just write on that topic. So as it says there, you need to focus in, after a bit of research, on a very precise title. A very small area of one of these four big areas. Now, most of you will get more value out of it if you choose a topic related to the program that you've registered for but you don't need to do that. If you've got an interest in one of the other ones, follow it. The idea is for you to choose a topic, negotiate it with me or agree it with me in the uh, tutorials and workshops on Tuesdays, and then go deliver a really great article. <coughs> detection, you know, the thing you were supposed to be researching using Plato during the last week. Um, I hope that everybody has looked at Plato and gone through the tutorial, certainly for the referencing and citing part. I would also like you to go through the, um, the plagiarism section as well, just so that you know what the things you need to avoid, whether it's copying or working too collaboratively together, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, we will be putting all of your assignments through something called Turnitin, which checks for what it calls similarity. And then you look at the strings of words which it can show or identify are coming from all sorts of places over the web, from between each of you and from your individual assignment to lots out there. You must use Harvard citing and referencing. The person you are writing for is someone who's interested in computers and the way they work and the way they help us do our job, the way they help us live our lives. 
to be Generation X, Y, Z, I generation people. You will use the template that's in the uh, course resources, the, SF, the Springer LNCS uh, template. The content from the beginning of the introduction to the end of the conclusion sections will be precisely three pages, plus zero lines, minus or, or no more than five to ten lines less than that. It says, um, in fact, it, it says more than two lines. Now, the two lines is there because turn it in is not a perfect system, and even though you can see in the Word document you've got exactly three pages, on occasion, Turnitin fouls it up in creating the sort of PDF version that it uses and stores internally. It will suddenly flow that over onto the fourth page. So as long as your Word document doesn't, it, for that section, doesn't exceed three page pages, no problem. There will be other pages wrapped around it. There'll be a title page with your, the name of the article, your name, your email address, your university email address, that is. Um, there will be a short abstract as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. And there will be, on the page at the end, which is, I guess will be the fourth, fifth page, you will have your bibliography or list of references in perfect Harvard standard. Now, if you wish to put a few illustration pictures in there or graphs, then there will be a second part to your references, which is the list of links to, or references to your sources for those pictures. This is the only time that you will separate out your bibliography into two sections. One, the text sources, and two, <coughs> for the images or the pictures because I want it that way this time. Rest of the time, a single integrated bibliography. You will see here some guidance on the structure that you need. You will have an abstract, which is a summary of the article, including any conclusions in no more than 10 lines. An introduction to set the context of what you're writing about, or again, maximum of 10 lines. Then there will be a critical evaluation in terms of the change in technology from then to now, and a critical evaluation of the impact of those changes. So it's changed from there to here. Face-to-face -face meeting and telephones, as in landline phones, you know, the things that stick, you have one of in your house and everybody uses it, to today, so all those social networky sort of things, you've got all of those mobile phones where we each have our own one. We've got Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, etc., etc., etc. What is the impact of that? I suggest that you use a kind of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, <coughs> threats type of framework, the SWOT framework, to guide you in thinking about the uh, critical evaluation of the impact of the changes. And that could be on me as an individual, it could be on us broadly as a society, it could be us at university, it could be us as in business, and so on. And then a shortish conclusion. You'll be assessed on just three criteria. One, presentation, worth 20% of the grade. Context, and content, you can see the words there. Now, presentation is you've got to stick to that Springer <coughs> LNCS format perfectly. <coughs> you might well find that it's probably easiest to use an ordinary document in Word to create and then pop it into the Springer one, <coughs> copy-paste special, uh, text only. Pro it works rather nicely and then you get it formatted easily. And then the content, and that starts off, you've got 100% of your 20%, so you've got 20 points available to start with, and there's a list at the end of this document that shows you how quickly and how easy 
easily it is, if you're, if you're careless, to lose some or all of those 20 marks. Context and content, uh, content I'm going to show you how those are assessed in a second. Look at the red uh, text. If you do not have any citations or you do not have a list of references, then it doesn't matter how well you've written it, you will only get 35% overall. That means you're going to redo the assignment. Because if you are working in an academic environment such as here, you must identify your sources. And I'll show you the link to a little presentation in a couple of minutes. Ideally, I would like to see you keep this grid in there so that you can self-assess yourselves as you're developing. As you're developing your work, so that you can prove to yourself, yes, I've done all the stuff on your left-hand side in presentation terms, that you've got the right formatting, and so on and so forth. And then, and we'll talk a bit about this tomorrow, in terms of the 20 and 60% of uh, content and uh, context and content. And I'll be taking you through how you can use those two uh, boxes on that side of the grid to help select a really good, promising topic that will allow you, if you do a really good job, to get the 95% grades for those two And then I'll show you the 85, the 75, and so on. And that reminder. Most important. We have, each year we get one or two people who don't bother to produce any citations as to where they found information, who don't bother to put a list of references in. Yet suddenly you've got a referral. Redo it. Not very helpful. One good reason why you shouldn't use Internet Explorer to get into this side of the systems. I saw this today, someone flashed it up as part of my feed in LinkedIn. And one of the things, the reason I haven't given you a word count but I've given you a page limit is because that's what we academics have to do. And if you're writing for articles or articles for journals, whether academic or even for professional journals, they often say, here is the word limit. And if you're, sorry, the page limit in this format. And if you meet that, great. If you don't, well, I get it rejected. So I have to meet typically about four or five, six different templates every year. And they're all in page limits. And if you exceed it, I get a request back, Richard, do you want to spend $100 per page? Nope. So I then have to edit it back. And this is one of the things you need to do, is to edit and very, very ruthlessly get rid of spare words. So it's up there on the on, uh, course resources. Just the thought how to go through and remove words which are going to cause problems and take you over your page limit. Or other assignments here for other mo modules will probably be in uh, word count. It's variable, we vary. And the reason we vary is not to cause you confusion, but it's because we have different learning outcomes, different learning objectives to try and help you to develop to become really excellent employees. Because when you're out there at work, <coughs> things change all the time. If, if, as I used to move through Rolls-Royce departments, all had subtly different needs and requirements. And so you have to get used to variable environment. 
We will try to keep to the LMCS uh, format, I think, you'll find for the next two, three years for you, because that's kind of helpful. But there may be other things going on that suggest in different circumstances, it may be useful to use a different template. And we will explain to you carefully why that's necessary. to now, because I might forget in those lists of reference at the back end and why they're there. We won't cover all of it today, uh, but I want to cover the important bits, and I'll probably cover some of it as well uh, tomorrow. <coughs> those of you who've used Plato to go through the plagiarism side of Plato will have, been, have come across some of these ideas already. Quoting... A quotation is a direct perfect copy, or nearly perfect copy, and almost with no modification of what someone else has written. It could be a copy-paste from an electronic source or retyping. <coughs> the most important thing for you guys to remember is in the field of computing, information technology, there is almost no need ever to provide a quotation. In literature, law, there are a few specific and very special occasions where it is necessary or appropriate to provide a reasonably long sort of paragraph size <coughs> quotation. In law, that's because the, people, the lot, um, judges who are making the judgments or talking about and publishing the judgments of a, a case in law are often using very, very precise words, and they choose their words with incredible care and precision. Outside of that, outside of some academic work in literature, <coughs> most academics do not choose their words particularly carefully. And so there is no justification for quoting stuff other than to fill the word count or the page length and be lazy. But you have to remember that academically, in academic reading, particularly in our field here, we, we the readers, the academic readers, the, lot, um, the people you're writing for, your lecturers, are blind <coughs> to quotations. We have mental snowplate, snow paint. So there's no point in putting it there, because all it proves is you can find a source and you can do the technical challenge of copy and paste. So what? And I'll mention this phrase, so what, a lot while I'm with you. Because we want to use your writing as a window into your head, into your brain, to understand how you think and how you analyze, how you come to conclusions. And so if you have got a quotation there, we won't see it. You know, it's a bit like adverts on web pages. How many of you ever notice those adverts that are there? We all, or are you blind mostly to them and ignore them? Pardon? You see them because they're in the way, but you don't take them in. They just happen and you find a way of clicking past them or you don't even notice them. How many ever noticed any of the little yellow uh, sponsored ads and links at the top of Google um, retrievals or Bing retrievals. We taught ourselves to ignore them, haven't we? 
So we teach ourselves to ignore those uh, quotations because they don't contribute. They're just filler. Because you need to then write about that quotation and explain A, why it's relevant, B, what it contributes, and C, what you're going to do with it in your article to move the argument along from here to there to there. So don't provide any quotations. The only situation where a quotation or two, and they should be short, will be definitions of critical terms, just so the readers actually understand where you're coming from and how you're getting from this list of three or four alternative uh, quotations to the one that you are going to use in your analysis. So you need to check that your essay, your article, makes sense without any of those quotations. <clears throat> if, however, you do feel that there is a good reason that you can justify, explain why it's appropriate, then make sure that the reader can see clearly that that set of words is a quotation. It might be in quote marks if it's in a sentence, because there's only a few words in the middle of a sentence, or if it's a full sentence or paragraph, make sure there's a separate paragraph indented so I can see it and put in brackets at the end the reference to the source. That citation that, refer, uh, citation that you've been working on in Plato. Brackets, surname of the first author, perhaps, comma, year of publication, close brackets. And the point about it is that it allows me, as a reader, or your colleagues as readers, to find at least the article or the book where you got that information from if they are interested in following it up. It does these three things. That's why in academic writing we have these three things. It supports your statements. It says this is where the evidence was found. It tells people whose ideas you're working with, whose ideas you've borrowed. You know, we don't like having our physical devices like those borrowed and stolen. Why should we steal and borrow other people's ideas? The intellectual property is just as important to people as their physical property, uh, property. And it shows that you are able to do this thing called academic research. Finding sources, a variety of sources, different perspectives that you build on to create a really interesting story that you're writing. A way of telling the story about your research. Don't feel that, there, that we get bored with seeing citations. So if you've got three or four really interesting ideas in a paragraph. Don't feel, oh, I only need to put one citation to that source at the bottom end of the paragraph. You can put it wherever the big ideas are being incorporated. And those of you who do a lot of programming, if you borrow some lines of code from a code library or from a post <coughs> somewhere, We'll find it and turn it in. So make sure that you identify the sources of what we might call borrowed code. Most important. If you are making a state, assert, an assertion, a statement of fact, this is the case, then you need to justify that assertion and give the source. <coughs> provides your credibility, but it also pr proves that what you have just spent hours and hours and hours of writing is not a fairy story like, say, Harry Potter. Because, you know, we know there aren't any citations or references in Harry Potter. It's a fairy story. But what you are writing for this assignment and for all of the assignments here in the University of Derby through your next three years of academic work, each of those is a piece of academic work. It needs to have research-based evidence as a foundation for your analysis. It is not a fairy story. The only way you can prove it is by 
providing all those citations and references. I'll introduce the so what principle here because I'm going to be using it back at you all the way through the next few weeks. I should be challenging you with so what. Because I will teach you questions, I will not teach you answers. Now, I'm sure some of you thought you came to university to learn the answers, didn't you? How many thought you came here to learn answers? A few. How many thought you came here to learn questions? One or two. Why do I say I will teach you questions but not answers? Because you'll decide and go look for the answers yourselves. Yes, you'll go and look for the answers yourself. And part of it is the questions, if I look across business, the areas I've taught here at the university in the last 10, 12 years, business, computing, informatics, analytics, and so on, the questions have not changed in 40 odd years in IT. By and large, a few extra ones being asked, but mostly they're the same ones. The answers are incredibly different just because of time, the technologies, but also as you guys go out into the real world, each company you go to work on has a different context. The questions that you need to ask will always be similar. The ones I was asking as a training systems analyst in 1975 or 74. But the answers in every single company, almost year by year, will be different. So learn the questions and develop the answers based on research. Find out how the different technologies actually will contribute to a really good answer, a really great system. So that's what So What is all about. It helps you to work out, am I doing the right thing? Is it actually relevant? Does it actually contribute? And that's what I'll be reflecting about. So find this uh, presentation and work through it yourselves overnight, and we'll come back to a bits of it, to some bits of it tomorrow in the tutorial. Thank you, folks. See you tomorrow. And could I have the? Uh